what are the different crowns? The question we will consider is, what are the different crowns? It is a clear scriptural principle that believers earn rewards for their service. Let's go to Luke chapter 19, verse 11. Luke 19, 11. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable. Because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Verse 16, Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little have thou authority over ten cities. So if you see what's happening in that passage, the, the Lord entrusted a pound to various servants. One of them invested that pound, managed it carefully, and earned ten pounds. When the Lord returned, what did he, he give him? He gave him authority over ten cities. That was a reward for being a faithful servant. Verse 18, and the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. Well, you, you see there proof in multiple verses that the reward that was given to the servants pertains to authority, to, to rulership, to leadership responsibility. And what we're going to see as we dig into this is Scripture frequently calls those rewards crowns. So let me give you an overview of what we're going to cover. We believe there are four different crowns mentioned in the New Testament. Others have different views as to the number. We think there are four. There are two crowns mentioned in the Pauline epistles. One is the crown of righteousness. The other is the crown of rejoicing. We'll look at both of those. There are also two other types of crowns mentioned elsewhere in the New Testament. One is the crown of glory, and the other is the crown of life. Now, some will say that the crowns not mentioned by Paul are not available to the body of Christ. We don't think that's the case. We think that once you see what the crowns are, you will agree that all four of these crowns, the crown of righteousness, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of glory, the crown of life, are all available to believers either under the kingdom program or the mystery program. So let's look at each crown separately. And we'll start with the crown of righteousness. So 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. 2 Timothy 4.8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So there's clearly a crown of righteousness, and what is it given for? Well, it's given unto all them also that love his appearing. What some will say is they'll say, well, all saints love Christ's appearing. Everyone is happy about the rapture. So the crown of righteousness, some would say, is a crown that every single person gets. Sometimes what people say is the crown of righteousness is the righteousness of Christ, and the righteousness of Christ is imputed to you when you believe. When you believe the gospel, you are justified, you are declared righteous. And so some will say the crown of righteousness is a crown that every believer gets because it's the righteousness of Christ 
which you have by virtue of being saved. I don't think that's what the crown of righteousness is myself. I believe that the crown of righteousness is about the believer's walk, about the believer's conversation, the believer's manner of living. Now, why do I say that? The important question that we need to answer is, what does it mean to love his appearing? And I'm going to suggest to you what it means, is it means to live in light of the Lord's return. So let's look at a couple verses. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 5. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 5. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. So Paul's prayer there is that the Lord would direct the Thessalonians' hearts into the patient waiting for Christ. And what we are to do is we are to patiently wait for the Lord to return. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. That's another verse telling us to wait for the Lord's coming. Get 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 7. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 7. So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we've seen multiple verses there. They, they all reference waiting for the Lord's coming, so it's pretty obvious we're supposed to wait for the Lord's coming. But what does it mean to wait for the Lord's coming? Let me give you an example. A lot of times when you think of the word wait, you think of it as in waiting for a bus or waiting for a plane, where what happens is you get to the bus stop and you get there before the bus arrives, because if you get there after the bus arrives, you miss the bus. So you get there in advance of the bus, and you just wait. You just sit there, and you sort of kill time. I mean, you don't really, you're just sitting there. And, and so sometimes when people think of the word wait, it's, come on, make it happen. They think of waiting as a passive activity where you're just counting the moments until the thing you desire to happen happens, whether it's the bus arriving or the plane arriving or whatever it is. But let's consider what the word wait means. And so uh, here's the definition of wait from the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. First definition, to stay or rest in expectation. In, in other words, you're, you're staying or resting, but it's, it's what? It's in, it's in expectation. In other words, you're anticipating something to occur. What I'm going to suggest to you is that waiting for the Lord is not the passive sitting on a bench waiting for a bus, is that it's active. It's watching, it is preparing, and because the Lord is going to return, we do certain things. We don't just sit here. There's actually action that we are supposed to take. So look with me at Colossians 3, verse 4. Colossians 3, verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear... Then shall ye also appear with him in glory. So when the Lord Jesus Christ appears, we're going to appear in glory. That's going to be a wonderful event. Notice verse 5. Mortify therefore. Well, there's action we're supposed to take. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. See, what those verses are saying is that saints should mortify the flesh, put the flesh to death in light of Christ's appearing. In other words, in light of Christ's appearing, 
We're supposed to do something, not just sit around. We're supposed to put the flesh to death. Yet 1 Timothy 6, verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hath, hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Verse 13, I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. Verse 14, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. What Paul's saying there is, I'm giving you some instructions to do. Fight the good fight of the faith, lay hold on eternal life. He gives a charge and so on. Keep this commandment, then it says, without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. What he's saying is, I'm giving you these instructions, and you need to keep them. You need to keep them without spot, unrebukable, until what? Until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me put it a different way. Are you going to have to worry about sin after the rapture? Are you going to have a problem with sin in heaven? And the answer is you're not. Because at the rapture, you're going to get a new body that is incorruptible, that has no sin nature. So you're not going to have to worry about sin after the rapture. But does God want us to live in a way that is holy up to the rapture? And the answer is yes, he does. We're to fight the good fight of the faith. We're supposed to keep that commandment without spot, unrebukable. We're supposed to mortify, therefore, our members which are upon the earth. In other words, in light of Christ's appearing, there are some things that God expects us to do. Look with me at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. What those verses are saying is, don't get entangled with the affairs of this life so that we can fight the good fight of faith, that we can be the servants that God would have us to be. Get Titus 2, verse 11. Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Verse 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. When you preach grace, people will frequently say to you, well, you're saying you can live any old way you want. You're saying that you could rob a bank and go to heaven. You're saying that your works don't affect your salvation and you can live any old way you like. Well, it's true that your works do not affect your salvation. But does grace teach you to live in the flesh? Notice what verse 12 says. And let me read verse 11 with it. I want to read them together. So, Titus chapter 2, 11, for the grace of God, that's the subject, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. Here's what grace teaches us. It doesn't teach us walk in the flesh, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's what grace teaches us. That's how we ought to live. Now notice verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, if we love his appearing, well, that's, that's where we started, right? Because the crown of righteousness is given to all them that love his appearing. Well, if we love his appearing, then what we ought to do is keep the commandments that he gave us to keep until his appearing, including denying ungodliness and worldly lusts and living soberly, righteously, and godly. Yet Luke 12, verse 35. Luke 12, verse 35. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. In other words, be ready. Verse 36. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, 
that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Well, if, if they're going to open unto him immediately, they have to be watching to be able to respond immediately. Verse 37, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet, and he will come forth and serve them. What the servants are doing is they are watching for the Lord's return. They're ready, and when he arrives, they are ready to serve him. Well, that, that's the idea. Look at Luke 12, verse 43. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. Well, if he's making him ruler, that's a position of authority. Doesn't that sound like a crown? Let's get one more set of verses. Get Ephesians 2, and we'll look at verse 8. Ephesians 2, verse 8. Now, I know you're familiar with these verses, but let's look at them. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We quote that verse all the time in presenting the gospel, and that verse makes absolutely clear that your salvation has nothing, nothing to do with works. It is 100% by grace, and it's obtained through faith. It's very clear about that. But notice verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Well, is verse 10 a contradiction of what Paul just said in the prior two verses? Obviously, the Holy Spirit doesn't contradict himself. So what are those three verses saying? Well, what verses 8 and 9 are saying is that salvation, how you get justified from your sins, how you get declared righteous, your ticket to heaven is based solely on faith and has nothing to do with works. You're saved by grace, not works. But verse 10, now that you're saved, what does God want you to do? Does he want you to live the same old way you lived when you were lost? No, he doesn't because you were created. You're God's workmanship and you're created unto a specific purpose, and that is you are created unto good works. So should the believer be doing good works constantly every day? The answer is yes. So let's return back to our question. What is it to love his appearing? It is living as if the Lord could return any minute by living holy lives and contending for the faith. The crown of righteousness isn't the righteousness we get because we're saved and we're justified. It's not that. The crown of righteousness is the practical righteousness. It's the godly living that God desires of every member of the body of Christ. We are to love his appearing by living as if he could come any moment and thus living holy lives and contending for the faith. The crown of righteousness is thus the crown for a believer's good works. It's for Christ living in us. So that's the crown of righteousness. What about the crown of rejoicing? That's the second Pauline crown. Look with me at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 18. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? So Paul asked the question, what is our crown of rejoicing? And then he answers it, Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Well, the crown of rejoicing obviously refers to other people. He says, For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? What's our crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Look at verse 20. For ye are our glory and joy. It's very clear that Paul's crown of rejoicing is the saints. That's what he says. Yet Philippians chapter 4 and verse 1. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 1. 
Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, he's obviously addressing the brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Paul specifically says in Philippians 4.1 that the dearly beloved, the saints, are his crown. What's the idea of this? Well, the, the crown of rejoicing refers to the people that you have ministered to in your life. The saints saved and the individuals edified. Think of it this way. If you have resolved the question of your salvation, in other words, you were a sinner, you were on your way to hell. When you believe the gospel, God gave you eternal life as a free gift. You have an eternal destiny in heaven that you cannot lose. Hallelujah. How glorious is that? How wonderful is that? Well, given that truth, what should be the next most important thing in your life? Getting a new car? Buying a bigger house? Getting a promotion at work? Those things are all trivial, aren't they? Those things are all temporary. Those things are going to pass away when this earthly world passes away. The most important thing we can do is tell other people the gospel. Teach them the scriptures so that they can be saved and they can be edified and built up in the faith. Get with me 1 Corinthians 9 verse 25. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 25. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. In 1 Corinthians 9.25, Paul mentions an incorruptible crown. Some folks will look at that description and they'll say, well, that's, that's a fifth crown. That's a different type of crown from all the others. I don't think so. Go up to verse 19. And as we look at the context, what is Paul trying to obtain? in 1 Corinthians 9. Let's look at the verses and see. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. Verse 21. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. What is Paul trying to do? He's trying to get people saved. He makes himself all things to all men so that he does not give offense, so that he can get them saved. Now, they're saved by grace. They're saved by the Holy Spirit. But what Paul's saying is, I'm doing this so that I can preach the gospel to them in a way that is believable and credible and persuasive so that they believe the gospel and be saved. That's what Paul's trying to do in 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9, 23, And this I do for the gospel's sake that I might be partaker thereof with you. Well, in 1 Corinthians 9, isn't it clear that the incorruptible crown is a reference to Paul's desire that all men be saved? What is the crown of rejoicing? If we could put it in simple terms, it's the soul winner's crown, if you, you use that term. The idea is this. And, and by the way, what, what a perfect name for it, the crown of rejoicing. So when you see someone in heaven that you shared the gospel with and they believe the gospel, won't that be a moment of rejoicing? And when they see you, won't that be a moment of rejoicing where they look at you and say, praise the Lord, you were so kind to tell me the gospel so that I could believe it and have eternal life. And in turn, you can look at them and say, what a blessing. The Lord in his graciousness used me, a 
very worthless servant to give someone the gospel. And I had the privilege of them believing that gospel and being saved and being my fellow member of the body of Christ for all eternity. The crown of rejoicing is aptly named because there will be much, much, much rejoicing for those saints that you have given the gospel and those that you have taught the scriptures. Let's go to the third crown, the crown of glory. Now this crown is not mentioned in the Pauline scriptures. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. 1 Peter 5, verse 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So there's a crown that's called a crown of glory, but what specifically is it? Look at verse 1. So 1 Peter 5, look at verse 1. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. What is the crown of glory about? Well, it's, it's pretty obvious that it's talking about elders that feed the flock of God, and then it describes them neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples. The way that life works on earth is how do lords and nobility operate? Well, they're above others. Other people serve them, and they have a, a higher position in terms of worldly ranking. But when Scripture talks about these elders in 1 Peter 5, it doesn't say anything like that. It says, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. The crown of glory is given for servant leadership. In other words, when you're truly a leader in the scriptural sense, what you do is you serve other people. And that's what's being described in 1 Peter 5. Look with me at Isaiah 28 verse 5. Isaiah 28, verse 5. We'll notice that the phrase crown of glory is used in other places in the scripture. So let's look at a couple of these. Isaiah 28, verse 5. In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty under the residue of his people. Well, there you can see that the crown of glory is described as a diadem of beauty. A diadem is a crown. So this crown of glory, what is the, what is the essence of it? What is the nature of it? Well, it's particularly beautiful. Look with me at Isaiah 62, verse 3. Isaiah 62, verse 3. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Do you see how that verse has two parallel sections? Thou shalt be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Well, the hand of the Lord clearly lines up with the hand of thy God. That is obvious. The crown of glory lines up with the royal diadem. So what does this tell us about the crown of glory? Well, the crown of glory is a particularly beautiful crown because it's a diadem of beauty, and it's a particularly royal crown. Let me give you this example if I could. We already saw from 1 Peter 5 that the crown of glory is given for servant leadership. The best example we have of that in the scriptures, and we can't live up to this, we can't match this, but it's a beautiful picture, is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ was the King of Kings, 
He was the Lord of Lords. He is the preeminent person in the universe. And what did he do? He became the suffering servant. He took upon himself our sins. He bore our shame. He endured the wrath that we deserve to endure on the cross. Well, what a particularly beautiful act of love to be the to as the king of kings, the lord of lords, to take on the form of the suffering servant and to endure those indignities to redeem mankind. So the crown of glory, it's particularly beautiful, it's particularly royal, and it is given for servant leadership. Let's go to the fourth crown. The fourth crown is called the crown of life. James chapter 1, verse 12. James chapter 1 and verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So there's a crown of life, and what we want to do is we want to understand what it's given for. Get with me Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. Remember that James 1, 12, talked about being tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Well, it's pretty clear what the crown of life is, isn't it? It's the martyr's crown. There's a crown that is given for being faithful unto death. Let me give you an example. We have this idea in our minds, it's like a, a movie scene type thing, where the saint is he's in, in custody, he's in prison, and he's being tortured, or he's being threatened with torture. And what happens is the persecutors say unto him, just deny your faith. If you deny your faith, then we won't torture you. And you can all imagine that example, and you can imagine situations that you could be put in. What people often think is they think, that's kind of scary, because what happens if I'm in that situation and I deny my faith? Because, you know, I'm weak. I could lose my salvation, you know, I could, I could, in a moment of weakness, I could give in, I could deny the faith, and therefore, I would lose my salvation and go to hell, so I hope that I'm never tried like that. Well, during the dispensation of grace, think about this, you have eternal security. You're saved by grace through faith, you're not saved by works. The moment you believe the gospel today, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit under the day of redemption you cannot lose your salvation. So if someone captures you and they say to you, deny the faith or we're going to kill you, we're going to torture you, we're going to hurt you, we're going to do all these bad things to you, you're not going to lose your salvation if you deny the faith because salvation is not based upon works. So if you deny the faith during the dispensation of grace, you don't lose your salvation. 2 Timothy 2, 12 and 13 says exactly that. But what you will do is you will give up the right to earn the crown of life. Because if when you're being tortured you are faithful unto death, God gives you a reward for that. It's called the crown of life. Look with me at... 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. We know from Romans 6 that we are baptized into Christ's death. Verse 12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. 
See how it talks about reigning? Again, the issue here is that crowns are positions of authority, of rulership, of governmental responsibility. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. People read that, that phrase, if we deny him, he also will deny us, and they say, look, if you deny the Lord, then he denies you and you go to hell. That's not true. Look at verse 13. If we believe not, which is beyond denying, it's actually not believing. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. See, what happens is this. When you believe the gospel, you are spiritually baptized into the body of Christ, and there is no portion of the body of Christ that is going to hell. It's just not happening. God cannot deny himself. The moment you believe the gospel, you're baptized in the body of Christ, you're made part of his body, you will not be in hell. What verse 12 is talking about, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. The idea there is that when we deny him in this life, we can lose rewards. We are denied the right to reign. We're not denied our salvation. So why should we not give in when we're persecuted? Why should we not give in when we're tortured and threatened with death? Well, the answer is, if you're faithful unto death, what do you receive? You receive a crown of life. So let's look at the four crowns then quickly again, just so we summarize them. The crown of righteousness, that's for living as if the Lord Jesus Christ could return any moment by walking in, in good works. It's the good works crown, if you will. The crown of rejoicing is about investing your life in people. It's about telling them the gospel and teaching them. It's, if I could use the shorthand, it's the soul winner's crown. The crown of glory is for servant leadership. It's the servant leadership crown. And the crown of life is for being faithful unto death. It's the martyr's crown. Now, one thing that's interesting, I'll just make this observation. It seems to me that Paul won every one of those four crowns, and you can too. So let's look at it. 2 Timothy 4, verse 8. 2 Timothy 4, verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So Paul clearly won the crown of righteousness. What about the crown of rejoicing? Get 1 Thessalonians 2.19. 1 Thessalonians 2.19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For ye are our glory and joy. Did Paul win the crown of rejoicing for winning people to Christ? Yes, he did. And 1 Corinthians 9 was further proof of that. What about the crown of glory for servant leadership? Get Romans 11.13. Romans 11.13. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. You may also recall that uh, in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul, Paul made himself the servant of all men that he might win them. So did Paul win the crown of glory? It seems like he did. And what about the crown of life, the martyr's crown? Look at 2 Timothy 4, verse 6. 2 Timothy 4, verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul knew that he was about to be executed for the faith. And so it seems Paul won the martyr's crown as well. Now let's, let's wrap up with this. God saves by grace in an instant. There's no works that are required. You're not saved on the basis of your works. You're not saved on the basis of what you do after salvation. You're just not. You have eternal security. But does God give crowns for serving him how he desires us to serve him? And the answer is yes, he does. Get 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24. Every believer during the dispensation of grace has eternal security. They can't lose their salvation. 
but should we strive for rewards? The answer is yes. 1 Corinthians 9.24, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. That's a command. It's a commandment to run. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. The corruptible crown that's used as an example, therefore, was the uh, the laurel wreath that, w- that was given for the winners of the Olympic Games, and it was made out of plant material. So what happens to the, the laurel wreath that you get that's made out of plant material? Well, it's, it's corruptible. It's very corruptible. It's very soon corruptible, isn't it? I mean, it's not going to last half a year. It's going to wither. Verse 26, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. What Paul was, is he was extraordinarily single-minded and driven in seeking a crown. This life that we have on earth is not a game. The fate of people's eternal souls hangs in the balance. And so we need to be serving God the way he desires us to serve him. And for us simply doing what we ought to do, God has chosen to reward us. How gracious, how kind, how loving of him to do that. Get 2 Timothy 2, verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. Well, in seeking a crown, we must strive lawfully. We must follow what the Scripture says. We hope this study has been beneficial to you. It seems to us there are four different crowns in the Scriptures. It seems to us that both, all four of them, are available to the body of Christ. All four of them are available to kingdom saints. What the crowns do is they give us clarity as What should we be prioritizing in life? What should we be doing? We should be living in light of his appearing, and we should be doing good works. We should be winning souls to Christ. We should be engaging in servant leadership by serving our fellow man. And if called upon, if given the opportunity, we should win the martyr's crown. We hope that this study has been beneficial to you, And we rejoice in everything that the Lord Jesus Christ has given us. Amen.